Occasionally did adventurous hunters and trappers and Indian traders venture beyond the mountain barriers to the west. It was an unknown wilderness. Welcome to my review of the case trapper knife. In my opinion, you can't seriously talk about the trapper knife pattern without exploring the historical and literary connotations of its name. That's why the intro to this video already exposes two important names in this context. Daniel Boone and James Fenmore Cooper. I will get back to these names in the second part of this video. For those of you who are just interested in the knife review, let's get started. First, please take a quick look at the model number. If you have watched my previous case knife reviews, I'm sure you must by now be fluent in case cutlery's abbreviations. The number 6254 is composed of three individual numbers. The 6 stands for the handle material bone, the 2 denotes the number of blades, and 54 is Case Cutlery's factory pattern number that denotes the trapper knife pattern. The suffix SS stands for stainless steel. The stainless steel Case Cutlery uses is called True Sharp Surgical Steel, which is a high carbon steel with excellent corrosion resistance. It also takes a pretty decent edge. Generally speaking, a trapper is a jackknife with two full-length blades. It typically comes with a clip blade with an elongated clip and a long spay blade. And as you can see, this case trapper knife follows this traditional pattern. Here is the clip blade and here we've got the long spay blade. By the way, clip blades with a very long clip portion are also called California clip blades because the blade shape vaguely resembles the shape of the state of California. Okay, let's believe that this is the true reason for the name, but indeed, the elongated clip is very characteristic. Just for comparison, the shape of the clip blade of this case, Barlow, is significantly different. As you can see, the clip part is shorter. The Trapper is a popular outdoor knife and some say it's the ideal hunter's knife. I'm neither a hunter nor a trapper, but I was surprised to read that according to a New York Times article, some 150,000 trappers ply their trade each winter in the United States and at least 70,000 in Canada. It would be interesting to know how many of them actually use a trapper knife. It has often been debated what purpose the long spay blade originally served. Hunters seem to prefer it for field dressing small game, but no matter what the intended use of the blades is, this blade combination makes the trapper a good utility and outdoor knife. You probably have already noticed the etching on the clip blade. This is a commemorative knife. William Russell Case, 
was the father of Casey's company founder, the company namesake, and the first company president. I will elaborate on this topic in a separate video. For now, let's move on to the handle construction. Another characteristic feature of the 54 pattern is this long dogleg style handle shape, which is very comfortable to hold, by the way. The standard size of a trapper is considered to be 4 and 1 8 of an inch closed, and that's exactly the length of this case trapper. There are nickel silver bolsters on both ends, and the two blades operate on individual back springs, which are separated by a center liner. The other multi-blade case knives I've reviewed so far only had two brass liners. But the blades were not separated inside the handle. For example, take a look at this three-blade stockman knife. There is no extra liner in the center. But this one is different. Between the two blades there is a third brass liner. The two nail nicks allow for easy opening. Some people claim to be able to tell the quality of a backspring by the snap sound. Well, I wouldn't go so far to say that they ring like a silver bell, but it is a satisfying sound. And I can tell you that the back springs are pretty solid. Now for the handle scales. The material is jig bone and the color is called chestnut. It's a beautiful color. The shades range from a light reddish brown to a deep dark brown. Really, really nice. The fit and finish of the knife is awesome. There are no gaps. The two smaller pins are absolutely flush with the surface of the handle scales and the heads of the center pin are perfectly embedded into the hills and valleys of the jig pattern. Before we move on to the second part of this video, let me give you a quick size comparison. The case trapper is clearly larger than the Victorinox Cadet or the Victorinox Climber, and it's a little smaller than the Victorinox Hunter. The second part of this video is dedicated to the trapper as the almost mythic archetype of the American frontiersman. When this knife pattern was invented, the American frontier period was over. But of course, the historical connotations of a name survive. This is not only true for this pocket knife pattern. The Finnish knife company Brisa sells a fixed blade with the model name Enzo Trapper. And of course, this also evokes the idea of a free, natural, wilderness way of life. Following the victory of the United States in the American Revolutionary War in 1783, the United States gained control of the British lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. But even in the years before and during the war, many settlers had already reached Kentucky and Tennessee and adjacent areas. The iconic incarnation of the American frontiersman is Daniel Boone. He was a trapper and hunter. He explored Kentucky in the late 1760s and early 1770s. In 1773, Boone packed up his family and with a group of about 50 emigrants, began the first attempt by British colonists to establish a settlement in Kentucky. Boone's name is closely connected to the Cumberland Gap which is a pass through the Appalachian Mountains. The Cumberland Gap is famous in American history for its role as one key passageway through the lower central Appalachians. It was discovered in 1750 by Thomas Walker, but it was a team of loggers led by Daniel Boone that widened the path and made it accessible to pioneers who used it to journey into the western frontiers of Kentucky and Tennessee. 
By the 1790s, the trail that Boone and his men built was widened to accommodate wagon traffic. In the 1770s, Daniel Boone was an obscure hunter and trapper. But when James Fenimore Cooper published the first three volumes of his five novel Leatherstocking Saga in the 1820s, Daniel Boone had already become a legend. At that time, and still today, Boone embodies the cherished American characteristics of rugged individualism. To some degree, James Fenimore Cooper modeled his fictional character Nettie Bumpo after Daniel Boone. Cooper also based some of his protagonist's adventures on episodes and exploits in Boone's life. So at the end of this video, I would like to turn your attention to Cooper's novel The Prairie from 1827. It is the third novel in the series of Cooper's Leatherstocking Tales, but chronologically it's the final part, as we see Natty Bumpo in his final year of his life. Why did I choose this novel? Throughout the whole novel, the protagonist Natty Bumpo is never called by his name, but is instead referred to as the Trapper. Like in The Last of the Mohicans, Cooper's protagonist is the loyal guide again. This time he proves helpful to a group of settlers in distress on the American frontier. I would like to read two passages. The first passage describes the first appearance of the main character. And this is one of the most remarkable passages from all five novels. Cooper creates a painterly image of his protagonist silhouetted against the setting sun. It is the classical apotheosis of a mythic hero. The sun had fallen below the crest of the nearest wave of the prairie, leaving the usual rich and glowing train on its track. In the center of this flood of fiery light, a human form appeared, drawn against the gilded background, as distinctly and seemingly as palpable as though it would come within the grasp of any extended hand. The figure was colossal, the attitude musing and melancholy, and the situation directly in the root of the travelers. But embedded as it was in its setting of garish light, it was impossible to distinguish its just proportions or true character. The effect of such a spectacle was instantaneous and powerful. The men in front of the emigrants came to a stand and remained gazing at the mysterious object with a dull interest that soon quickened into a superstitious awe. The next quotation is from the last chapter of the novel. Here Cooper describes the last moments of the trapper's life. What's worth noting here is that the time of day is sunset again. The trapper had remained nearly motionless for an hour. His eyes alone had occasionally opened and shut. When opened, his gaze seemed fastened on the clouds which hung around the western horizon, reflecting the bright colors and giving form and loveliness to the glorious tints of an American sunset. The hour, the calm beauty of the season, the occasion all conspired to fill the spectators with solemn awe. Suddenly, while musing on the remarkable position in which he was placed, Middleton felt the hand which he held grasp his own with incredible power, and the old man, supported on either side by his friends, rose upright to his feet. For a moment he looked about him as if to invite all in presence to listen, the lingering remnant of human frailty, and then with a fine military elevation of the head and with a voice that might be heard in every part of that numerous assembly, he pronounced the word, here. Some critics have seen Nettie Bumpo's role in this novel as a messianic one, functioning as a symbolic redemption for the American guilt of the ruthless dispossession of the Indians. Others see him as a spiritual representative of nature and the whole novel as an elegy on the passing of the wilderness. Enough said, read the book, you won't regret it.